June 13, 1944. While the Battle of Normandy was taking place in Europe, in the Pacific, the Americans began the Battle of Saipan. In this confrontation, the Japanese were going to have practically 100% casualties, defending the last island they could lose, before the Americans could bomb Tokyo with the bombers that would leave from said island. So, what we are going to see next, became one of the fiercest battles on the Pacific Front, being the prelude to what would come later on Iwo Jima or Okinawa. To put ourselves in a situation, we have to go back to the summer of 1942, in which, after the Japanese defeat at Midway, the Japanese Empire definitively lost the initiative in the war, and it would be the United States that went on the offensive. One of the first places where they began to gain ground was in the so-called Solomon Islands, which are located northeast of Australia. By the beginning of 1944, both the Solomon Islands and the Gilbert Islands were already in American hands, and their advance was expected to be unstoppable. Little by little, during the first months of 1944, Japan was losing more archipelagos such as the Marshall Islands, and the Americans slipped into the heart of the island empire that Japan controlled. This meant great chaos for the Japanese who had small garrisons on thousands of islands, making it impossible to supply them all. In addition, the United States Army was not going to spend time and resources to assault all of them, since occupying the most important ones was more than enough, so hundreds of them were completely isolated as the Americans advanced. Saipan Island is located about 1,400 kilometers south of Tokyo, right in the middle of the Mariana Islands archipelago. This was the island of the archipelago that is located further north, where an airfield could be built from which to bomb Japan. So if Saipan fell, Tokyo and other major Japanese cities would be exposed to continued air raids. To prevent its fall, the Japanese had 31,000 soldiers inside Saipan, who, together with its civilian population, had been digging all kinds of bunkers and trenches throughout the island for months. In addition, there were about 44 Japanese tanks of the 95 Hago type concentrated in it, which, although they were much inferior to the American Shermans, stood up to the end. The main Japanese commander in charge of the defense of Saipan was Lieutenant General Saigo, who, as we are going to see, would not survive this fierce battle. On the other hand, on the attacking side, were the 5th U.S. Amphibious Corps that had some 70,000 soldiers, specifically the 2nd and 4th Divisions of the Marine Infantry who would land on Saipan. Admiral Richmond Turner and General Holland Smith were in command of this operation, with which the island was to be conquered, which in total was 24 kilometers long by 6 kilometers wide. On June 13, the U.S. Navy began a heavy bombardment against the island, firing a total of 40,000 projectiles of all kinds, among which some 2,400 of more than 400 mm caliber stand out. To this initial naval attack force, a second was added over the next few days, which completely devastated the island. It was clear to the Japanese commanders that the next step their enemy was going to take would be to land on Saipan with their ground troops. So, in an attempt to demoralize them, they began radioing messages to them saying they knew they were coming and were waiting for them. The landing finally took place on the morning of June 15, when 300 boats with 8,000 soldiers headed for the island. After a little deception, in which the Americans led the Japanese to believe that they were going to land most of their troops in the northwest of the island, they finally ended up doing so much further south. This caused the Japanese to send many units to the north, leaving the southwest coast less protected. The Americans landed relatively easily and without much opposition, and it was once when they had already started to advance up the beach that the Japanese opened fire with everything they had. It was at this moment that a fierce combat began, wreaking havoc among the Americans who could no longer count on the support of their naval artillery, since they were not going to fire at the Japanese defenders who were so close to them. What is certain is that the situation became so critical that Admiral Turner was about to cancel the attack and withdraw the landed troops to the ships, but finally decided to continue sending reinforcements and the battle continued. After 12 hours of intense combat, some 20,000 U.S. troops had landed on Saipan, gradually tipping the balance in their favor. Thanks to this impressive force that they were able to amass in such a short time, 
Sheer numerical superiority allowed the Americans to break through the fragile Japanese lines and link up the separate 2nd and 4th Marine Division beachheads. This posed a great threat to the island's defense, as the Americans now threatened to cut Saipan to the south and quickly seize the Japanese airfield. So, and since the Japanese could not afford something like this, before dawn more than 2,000 Japanese soldiers launched two desperate suicide counterattacks against this American beachhead. These attacks ended in slaughter, as Marines supported by Sherman tanks, who had been landing all day, completely slaughtered them, killing some 700 Japanese fighters on the spot. Although the American soldiers had been surprised by this near-suicidal attack, what happened the next day was even worse. As the 4th Marine Division pushed inland, the Japanese Lieutenant General Saito massed all his tanks and hurled them at the Americans in a desperate attempt to slow his advance. Shortly before, he had had a phone call with Emperor Hirohito who had demanded that he not lose the island, as it would be the beginning of a real hell in Japan with the massive bombings that were coming. This Japanese armored attack was once again repulsed since with only a 37mm cannon they could do nothing against the American Shermans. This made the situation for the Japanese very complicated, and by June 18th they had to abandon the airfield that was already impossible to defend. Furthermore, they risked being encircled if the Marines cut off the island in the south. From now on, a new phase of fighting would begin in which the Americans would have to gradually enter the interior of the island, in which there were jungle and mountain areas. What was clear was that with the airfield in American hands and with a portion of the island under their control, it was only a matter of time before Saito was defeated. The Japanese high command knew that the loss of Saipan was a turning point, so they could not afford to lose it. Thus, they sent a powerful fleet to support the defense that would lead to the so-called Battle of the Philippine Sea. If they achieved a victory, they could move the American fleet away from the Mariana Islands and thereby defend the entire archipelago in which Saipan was located. This naval battle that we will analyze in depth in another program, took place on June 19th and 20th, and ended with another harsh Japanese defeat. In total, they lost three aircraft carriers and 650 aircraft that they could never recover. This meant that the Japanese positions on Saipan could not be reinforced and that their soldiers were destined for annihilation. Returning to the situation inside the island, we have to indicate that it was critical for the Japanese. Barely out of supplies or ammunition, they were being bombarded by both naval and land artillery, and by U.S. aircraft, which repeatedly pounded their defenses in central and northern Saipan. Thus, on the 23rd and 24th, the U.S. troops continued their offensive towards the north of the island, at a slow but constant pace. This was a combat that was practically fought in hand-to-hand -hand due to the fact that the Japanese were hiding in all kinds of caves and makeshift trenches, in which the number of casualties was overwhelming. Basically, the Americans tried to take Japanese defensive positions, while the Japanese soldiers resisted and after the fighting stopped, they tried to launch their counterattacks. This process was repeated over and over again until the Japanese ran out of troops, ammunition, or food to continue fighting. Due to weakening Japanese resistance, by early July the Americans accelerated their pace of advance, and Lt. Gen. Saito knew that his end was near. On July 7, when Saito was fully aware that all was lost, he ordered one last great bonsai charge, so that the honor of his soldiers would remain intact despite defeat. The result of that bloody episode that ended in a new Japanese defeat was more than 4,000 dead Japanese and some 1,000 casualties for the American side. As a curiosity, this was the bonsai load with the most deaths of the entire Second World War. Furthermore, while this was taking place, Lt. Gen. Saito, committed suicide along with his senior officers and ordered his mortal remains to be burned and destroyed. After this failed attack, on July 9, the Americans already controlled 90% of the island, leaving them only the northern area of Saipan where the Japanese urban center was concentrated. The image that the US troops found there was horrifying, as some 7,000 Japanese civilians had taken their lives. Many of them did it by jumping off a cliff into the void. This was one of the bloodiest battles in the Pacific, which ended with some 30,000 casualties for the Japanese side between military and civilians and 16,500 for the Americans.
Thus, it was one of the first warnings that the U.S. commanders received of what was to come. In the future, the battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa would take place, which would be even worse. The most important consequences of this defeat for Japan were the dismissal of its Prime Minister Tojo, and the United States' acquisition of an island from which its bombers would be within reach of Japan. February 19, 1945 The Battle of Iwo Jima, being one of the bloodiest of World War II in the Pacific, has begun. In this confrontation there will be a very important element, which will mark the rest of the battles that still remain to be fought between Japan and the United States. Basically from this point on, the Japanese commanders have understood that victory will no longer be possible, and their strategy is going to be to inflict as many casualties as possible on the U.S. Army during the battle for the island. The military situation for Japan at the time this battle began was as follows. Since the end of 1943, Japan had been gradually losing islands in the South Pacific, in a process that only accelerated irremediably. After losing archipelagos such as the Gilbert Islands, the Marshall Islands or the Salomon Islands, in mid-1944 the Japanese lost the important island of Saipan. If you remember the program that we recently uploaded about this battle, the loss of this island meant that for the first time, American bombers were able to bomb Japan from the Saipan airfields. Thus, the next step towards Japan was through Iwo Jima, which would end up giving it control of the sector of the Pacific Ocean that is to the south of the island of Japan. With the conquest of Iwo Jima, they would also gain important airfields that brought them closer to Japan, as well as the elimination of the radar stations that the Japanese had on Iwo Jima, and that intercepted American planes leaving from Saipan. To carry out this operation to conquer Iwo Jima, U.S. Admiral Nimitz once again had the 5th Amphibious Corps, with which he had also fought on Saipan a few months earlier. In total, it had some 110,000 troops, its ground assault force being the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions. On the other hand, General Kurabayashi had some 21,000 troops under his command, with the 109th Infantry Division being his main unit. Although the number of soldiers on each side is quite unbalanced, with respect to the Navy or aviation, the difference is even greater, since while the Americans had several hundred ships and planes, the Japanese had practically none. The only thing they had in their favor was that they had been preparing the defense of the island since mid-1944, building all kinds of tunnels and fortifications. As we have previously commented, the Japanese General Kurabayashi knew that in the face of such a disparity of forces, the American victory was inevitable. So he prepared to make his victory as costly as possible in human lives. Shortly before the battle Kurabayashi declared the following, We are here to defend this island to the limit of our strength. If our positions are overrun we will take bombs and grenades, and throw ourselves under the tanks to destroy our enemy. Long live the Emperor! Well, once the context has been seen, let's go to the development of the battle. General Harry Schmidt, commander of the Navy Landing Force, called for a heavy bombardment of the island during the 10 days before the amphibious assault, which was scheduled to take place in mid-February. However, this was rejected and finally the bombardment began only three days before the landing. Later when the battle ended, this was the subject of intense debate because the Japanese defenses were in good condition when the Marines reached the beach, so this short bombardment time was considered a serious mistake. It was February 19 when the Marines of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Divisions landed southwest of Iwo Jima. They did so along a beach about two miles wide, with the 5th Marine Division positioning itself on the left flank, the 4th in the center, and the 3rd on the right. The objective of each of them was the following. In the first place, the 5th Division had to enter Iwo Jima through its narrowest place and section the island as soon as possible. Later a part of it would take Mount Suribachi, while the rest of the division would advance along the north coast of the island. The 4th Division would take the first airfield on the island, and later advance to the northeast of Iwo Jima close to the coast. And finally, the 3rd Marine Division would head north into the central area of the island, taking the two remaining airfields. 
The first wave on the beach of Iwo Jima landed on February 19 at 9 in the morning. In accordance with Kuribayashi's plan, the Japanese did not open fire until the American soldiers had entered the island. Thus, some Marines thought that the naval artillery and aviation fire had already finished the job. Continuing with the operation, and in the face of the disbelief of the U.S. commanders, the disembarkation of troops and material continued as quickly as possible. It was at around 10 a.m. when Kuribayashi gave the order to open fire, and all hell broke loose on Iwo Jima. From that moment and for several hours, there was a real bloodbath on the American side. Deprived of their naval artillery support, due to being hand-to-hand -hand with the Japanese, the Marines had to fight their way through themselves, and using their explosive charges and flamethrowers they were able to begin to overcome the first Japanese defensive line at 11.30 in the morning. Despite the trap that the Japanese had prepared for them, at the end of that day, the island could be sectioned in two at its narrowest end, and half of the first airfield already fell into American hands. The worst part of all was taken by the men who landed on the right flank of the beach, specifically the 3rd Battalion of the 25th Infantry Regiment that belonged to the 4th Marine Division. And it is that to give us an idea, at the end of that first day, of the 900 men that said battalion had landed on Iwo Jima, 750 had lost their lives. One of the American commanders said, I don't know who he is, but the Japanese general leading this defense is a smart bastard. Once night fell, the Marines expected the usual Japanese bonsai charge, and they prepared for it. This had been the standard Japanese strategy in previous battles against enemy ground forces in the Pacific, as they did during the Battle of Saipan, or on any other island before it. In those attacks, for which the Marines were prepared, most of the Japanese attackers had been killed and the Japanese force had been greatly reduced. However, General Kuribayashi had strictly prohibited these bonsai attacks by Japanese foot soldiers, as he considered them useless. His intention from now on would be to resist in each defensive line that he had prepared, and for this he needed the greatest number of Japanese soldiers in each of them. After five days of combat, in which the Marines attacked with great caution, and had to gradually neutralize each Japanese defensive position, the situation was as follows. Mount Suribachi fell on February 23rd, generating one of the most famous photographs of World War II, which would later be imitated by the Soviets when they captured Berlin. On the other hand, already inside Iwo Jima, the first airfield and part of the second had also fallen into American hands, and the Japanese resisted in a wide defensive line, which crossed the entire island from north to south. It was here when the hardest fighting of the entire battle took place, in which the Americans had more than 12,000 casualties between dead and wounded, in their attempt to overcome the second defensive line inside Iwo Jima. In any case, by the end of that month of February, the Americans had more than 70,000 troops on the island, while those of their Japanese enemy did not stop falling, not exceeding 12,000 soldiers on these dates. In their favor, they had good defensive positions on rocky terrain, which gave them quite an advantage in subsequent combat. Added to the fact that there was a small plateau in the center of Iwo Jima, known as the Motoyama Plateau, made the clashes at the beginning of March a real bloodletting for the Americans. So much so that this episode was once again known as Motoyama's Meat Grinder. An important element that caused many casualties to the Americans, was that the entire island was full of underground tunnels, through which the Japanese could attack the Marines from behind, and recover positions that they had just lost. By the beginning of March, the situation on the island was as follows. The Americans attacked a Japanese defensive line until they surpassed it. Later they met another, which they bombarded with everything they had available before starting the ground assault. Unfortunately for them, these artillery attacks, despite being very powerful, were not very effective because the Japanese protected all their heavy equipment inside their tunnels. Later, when the artillery attack stopped, the Japanese returned to take up their positions and waited for their enemy to attack. This led to a series of American night attacks, which attempted to surprise the Japanese, attacking them when they had their heavy weapons hidden. This attack was successful, and he managed to advance, 
as well as eliminate many Japanese in their sleep. In retaliation, the Japanese launched a bonsai attack on the night of March 8, intending to strike back at the Americans. This was done in disobeying the orders of General Kurabayashi. Thus, the battle led to a coming and going of savage melee attacks, in which the number of casualties increased. Little by little the Japanese resistance became weaker due to the lack of men and ammunition, and by March 15 the Japanese defensive line was broken. A few days later, on March 18, Kurabayashi's depleted forces were divided in two in the northeast and southeast of the island, unable to do anything but wait for the bitter end to come. Two days earlier, on March 16, the island had been declared secured by the U.S. command, since the Japanese resistance groups no longer posed a danger. It was a few days later when the final Japanese charge took place on the night of March 25, in a suicidal act to keep the honor of the soldiers intact. It is estimated that some 300 Japanese died in it, causing the death of 50 Marines and another 120 wounded. It is not known exactly if General Kurabayashi led this last assault or not, since his body disappreciated him during those last days, and he was not heard from. As a curious fact, we have to indicate that two Japanese soldiers were hiding on the island until 1949, when they finally surrendered. The final result of these 36 days of combat was terrifying for the Americans because for the first time, they had more casualties than their Japanese enemy with a total of 26,000, of which almost 7,000 were deaths. The Japanese for their part had almost 100% casualties, having just over 18,000. This victory at Iwo Jima gave the Americans a greater facility to bomb Japan, and to begin their assault on the archipelago of islands in which Okinawa is located, which was later to be followed by the invasion of Japan itself. March 6, 1945. The bloody battle of Iwo Jima has just ended, showing the Americans how costly it is going to be to take every Japanese island from now on. With little time to digest what has happened in this battle, the Americans prepare to storm Okinawa, where they will fight in one of their worst battles of all of World War II. Having cornered the Japanese on their original islands, and having destroyed most of their fleet, the Americans prepare for one of their final battles in the Pacific. In his memory remain the conquest of Saipan or Iwo Jima, in which the Japanese have gradually perfected their defensive tactics. The American General Simon Bolivar Buckner is the commander in charge of the operation to conquer Okinawa, known as Operation Iceberg. Under his control he has seven U.S. divisions, being the 1st, 2nd and 6th Marines, and the 7th, 27th, 77th and 96th Infantry Divisions. In total, all his forces add up to about 180,000 troops. On the other hand, the Japanese have some 120,000 soldiers on the island, along with 24,000 militiamen and the rest of the civilian population who will not surrender under any circumstances. Despite having a greater number of troops, as well as total control of the sky and the sea, General Simon Bolivar knows that it will not be easy to gain control of the island, and that a very tough battle awaits him. So much so, that he himself would die during the battle. Although the Japanese had lost very important islands such as Iwo Jima or Saipan, which allowed the Americans to bomb Japan with planes that took off from these islands, losing the island of Okinawa was something they could not afford. Basically, it was the key island from which the future land invasion on Japan would be launched. Thus, the Japanese had been fortifying the island for months, and building all kinds of defenses. The Japanese General Mitsuru Ushijima, ordered to dig all kinds of underground tunnels as the main axis of his defense, and located most of his troops in the center and south of the island. This is because the north of the island is quite hilly and no airfield can be built, but the center and south are flatter. The battle for Okinawa began on March 25th when the U.S. Navy began to open fire on the island, causing hell for the Japanese. The American objective, as is evident, was to destroy as many Japanese defenses as possible, as well as eliminate as many Japanese soldiers as possible, before beginning the landing of troops. The next day, ground operations began on small islands to the west of Okinawa, 
where the U.S. Navy was intended to be based and defended while fighting on the main island continued. Let us remember that on this date the kamikaze attacks had already begun a long time ago, and the Americans feared that in this fierce battle for Okinawa, the Japanese would send everything they had available against them. It took the Americans about five days to take this small archipelago, after which, on April 1st, they were able to begin the assault on Okinawa. This landing took place in central Okinawa, and during that first day, the Americans encountered virtually no resistance. Thus, they advanced towards the center of the island and took a series of airfields that were in the area, believing that their Japanese enemy was totally defeated and that they had already obtained victory. 60,000 men managed to disembark during that first day without any kind of difficulty, being able to cut the island in those first days. The American general did not expect this success to come so quickly, and he gave orders to launch the second phase of the operation, which consisted of conquering the south and north of the island. The mission to attack the north fell to the 6th Marine Division, which was able to make its way through that mountainous area, and was able to reach the northern tip of Okinawa on April 13. Although later there was an attack by Japanese soldiers who had been isolated in the area, the Americans took effective control of the northern part of the island in the first two weeks of combat. However, in the south, the situation was very different. In any case, before we begin to analyze the heavy fighting that took place in the south, we have to point out the great naval battle that took place during these first days of fighting on Okinawa. This was known as Operation Tengo, in which the Japanese sent their star battleship, the Yamato, into combat in a desperate attempt to expel the Americans from around Okinawa. This was undoubtedly a suicide mission in which the Japanese sent the Yamato along with nine other warships. Unfortunately for them, this naval force was intercepted long before it could reach Okinawa and was attacked by hundreds of American planes and a few submarines, sinking the Yamato and several Japanese warships. With this, the last hope of the Okinawan defenders disappeared completely. After this small paragraph, let's return to the fighting that was taking place on the island. Late in that first week of April, the U.S. 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions began their attack in a southerly direction, now encountering strong Japanese defenses. After heavy fighting, the Americans were able to advance a few kilometers and overcome this first defensive ring, but they suffered some 1,500 casualties in just a couple of days of combat. It was at this moment that they realized the difficult task ahead of them. Little by little the days went by, and the American soldiers found themselves involved in a multitude of ambushes and traps that the Japanese had prepared. After months of preparation, the Japanese had created killing zones in which the Americans suffered thousands of casualties. The only thing the American side had going for it was that it could bombard these Japanese defenses with its naval artillery, but since the Japanese were well entrenched in underground caves, this bombardment did not have the desired effect. Thus, the flamethrower became another good ally of the U.S. troops. In an attempt to slow the American advance, the Japanese mounted a series of night attacks during the night of April 12, hoping to ruin their enemy's preparations for the next day. Like the vast majority of these attacks, the result was a massive massacre for the Japanese. On April 19, the American assault continued and they again attacked the Japanese positions. The island's barely six kilometers wide makes it a real bottleneck for the attacking troops who are forced to attack head-on over and over again. This assault on the Japanese defensive line called Kakazu ended with some 700 casualties for the Americans and more than 20 tanks lost, without achieving any significant advance. Because they could not outflank them in any way, the only thing the Americans could do was make the Japanese believe that they were going to land south of the island, with the objective that the Japanese kept a large number of their troops to the south, and did not send them to the north. Thus, the U.S. attack continued until the end of April, being able to advance little by little towards the south of the island. Faced with this situation, the Japanese General Mitsuru organized a series of counterattacks, in which he even considered disembarking behind the American lines. For this, he intended to use the few naval means and artillery that he had at his disposal. Ultimately, the Japanese general's plan failed. Because the Americans continued advancing south, 
Mitsuru had no choice but to send most of his troops north, because as his enemy advanced, the island widened more. The result of this movement was intense battles during the first weeks of May in which both sides suffered thousands of casualties. However, while the Americans could afford them, this was not the case for the Japanese who had no chance of receiving reinforcements or supplies, so their fighting capacity was reduced by the day. To aggravate the situation, on May 11, the Japanese carried out a large kamikaze attack against the U.S. fleet that surrounded Okinawa, damaging numerous ships including the famous Enterprise aircraft carrier that he had to withdraw from there due to the damage caused by the Japanese planes. At the end of that month of May, the situation on the island continued to get complicated due to the heavy monsoon rains, which turned the disputed hills and roads into a large swamp that made all fighting difficult. The land advance began to resemble a World War I battlefield, as troops became bogged down in mud and flooded roads prevented progress and largely the evacuation of wounded to the rear. The troops lived in a rain-soaked field, part garbage dump and part graveyard, with bodies left to die in every corner. Despite everything, on May 27 the city of Naha, which was the largest on the island, fell into American hands. Although they expected stiff resistance and a large civilian presence, the U.S. troops found the city virtually deserted. For those dates, the situation for the Japanese was desperate, and they had begun a retreat to the south of the island, with the sole objective of resisting as long as possible. The bloodiest battles in Okinawa were about to arrive. By the beginning of June, the Japanese forces were divided into two, positioning themselves to the south and southeast of the island. This isolated southeastern redoubt came under both land and amphibious attack by the 6th Marine Division, which was able to annihilate the Japanese defenders by mid-June. It should be noted that it was at this time that the many Japanese began to commit suicide inside their tunnels because they considered that all was lost. A few days later, the American General Simon Bolivar himself died while he was in an outpost supervising the advance of his troops, as a result of a Japanese artillery attack. With the objective of finishing eliminating the Japanese resistance that still remained to the south of the island, the Americans began a last operation on June 23 that took them a week to conclude, ending the Battle of Okinawa. After counting the casualties, the Americans saw that this was their bloodiest battle to date on the Pacific Front, with a total of 80,000 casualties between dead, wounded, and soldiers who went mad. Additionally, they lost almost 800 aircraft, along with 36 ships being sunk and another 300 being damaged. The Japanese for their part suffered some 110,000 military casualties, along with another 100,000 civilians. To this, we must also count the casualties of the naval combats in which we can include the Yamato. On the other hand, the consequences of this battle are very important. First, it made it clear to the Americans how expensive a complete invasion of Japan would be for them, since they would undoubtedly have to assume hundreds of thousands of casualties. Thus, many justify the launch of the atomic bomb as a consequence of the large number of casualties in this battle, although I personally lean more towards the position that the bombs were dropped mainly as a warning to the Soviet Union. In any case, it is clear that everything adds up. But what do you think, what do you think of these desperate battles that caused hundreds of thousands of casualties, when Japan had not had any chance of winning the war for a long time. Do you think that this massacre in Okinawa was the reason for the drop of the two atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki two months later? We recently uploaded a program analyzing another of the fiercest battles in the Pacific, this being Saipan, which I leave in the description in case you haven't seen it yet. Without a doubt, it was there that there was a before and after in the way of defending the islands. And so far this today's program, which I hope you have found interesting. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.